Today I'm going to describe the derivation of an analytic expression for the unloaded Q of a microwave cavity resonator. I think my approach is fairly generic and can be applied to quite a few structures. We will use a coaxial cavity resonator as the example to illustrate this procedure. In this structure, there's a metal rod suspended inside of a cavity that has metal walls. The cavity has radius B, rod radius A, length L, and there are ports to bring electromagnetic field in and to lead signal out, port 1 and port 2. I usually depict coaxial cables doing the job, or it could be waveguides, and I've depicted the furthermore weak coupling ports by showing the center conductors recessed way far back so that essentially you have a unloaded cavity resonator. The Q expression that we derive is the Q that you would measure given the electric and magnetic fields we're going to use. And those are the only two things you need to come up with an expression for unloaded Q is an expression for the electric and the magnetic fields inside of the cavity. For this case of a suspended metal rod inside of a vacuum filled metal cavity, the electric field and the magnetic fields in their fundamental resonance, that is the longest wavelength, lowest frequency resonance, are taken to be sinusoidal in nature. So the magnetic field goes to zero at the ends of the rods because magnetic field is associated with current and there's no place for the current to go. The electric field, on the other hand, has its maxima at the ends of the rods because of the ability of this rod to turn into an electric dipole which oscillates back and forth every half cycle. This is an approximate expression, especially since current on the metal housing walls can continue past the metal rod. A different field is actually supported, where you have residual fields beyond the extent of the rod. We're going to do a derivation of the unloaded Q without any consideration of that today. And we're going to get an expression that gives us cues that are fairly close to what you would measure if you've made a really flawless system. The magnetic field is related to current and the rod, of course. You use Ampere's law and write it as the current, I amps, on the metal rod over 2 pi r, where r is the distance away from the center of the metal rod. I'll write down an expression for the electric field that has both the R and the Z dependence shown explicitly. And you can reason what it is by going back to the introductory physics problem of two concentric cylinders, both conducting. The outer cylinder is at ground, and the inner cylinder is held at potential V sub zero. And if the inner cylinder has radius A and the outer cylinder radius B, the expression for the electric field is this portion the potential over R log of B over A. That's a standard E&M homework problem. Now it's varying in the Z direction along the rod, and the cosine models that variation from where I put the origin from Z equals zero to the end of the rod Z equals L. So Q is stored energy per cycle divided by the dissipated power per cycle. Let me put it this way, omega U over dissipated power. U is the energy stored in the resonator. Omega is just 2 pi f. And the dissipated power inside the resonator is the I squared r on the metal surfaces. And if there's lossy dielectric, it includes also dissipation in the dielectrics. So with these expressions, E and H, we can come up with the Q, but we need to refine this expression for the magnetic field a little bit more. The current in the rod is also taken as being sinusoidal, where there can't be any current at the ends of the rods because there's nowhere for it to go. And since the current is taken as being right on the surface, let's use this Ampere's Law solution to find the current in the rod. It's all at R equals A. The Z dependence will be a sinusoid, and so we have an idea of what the H dependence must be. I'm going to write it this way, where the magnetic field H at the surface of the rod is the value that it has at the center of the rod, times sine for the fundamental pi over L Z. For now, I will leave this N in here because you can calculate the expression for the unloaded Q for higher harmonics as well with these expressions. Go ahead and put this expression for I in right there. We will use that as our expression for the magnetic field. So we have an electric field and we have a magnetic field. 
Now we need to use them to calculate the dissipated power and the stored energy. Let's begin with the dissipated power, which we get from the I squared R argument. So if you write it this way, that I is the RMS current, or you can write it as one half, and that I is the peak current, and that's what we're going to do. Now what do we use for I? It's a distributed system, and so you need a distributed current, and I is not the thing to use when you need distributed current. And I'll remind you of the surface current density, K, which has units of amps per meter, and that's what we're going to use. It's related to the magnetic field, it's in fact the magnetic field cross the normal. And we have to integrate it over the surface because surface current density in general depends on where you are. So let's write it like this, not just I squared R, but I is replaced with the surface current density. So now we have to integrate I squared over the area. R sub S is the surface resistance, still in units of ohms. K is in units of amps per meter. And again, I'll refer you to any standard electromagnetism textbook to get a grasp of K, the surface current density. This integration needs to be done over all surfaces, so the rod and the housing are separate surfaces. They are different radii, A and B. You can put in the expression, then, that we're going to use for the magnetic field, H. Since we're interested in the magnitude of N cross H, and N that is normal to the surface, and H, the magnetic field at the surface, are already perpendicular to each other, you just have to put H squared in for K squared. So put that in. The same thing happens over the housing surface, and it's the same argument, and you also have an integral over sine squared. It's just now the radius is B instead of A. Solve these integrals, and you have the dissipated power inside the resonator in terms of the surface resistance on the rod and the surface resistance on the housing. I, I wrote them out as separate values because they might be different materials. The energy stored in the resonance is a combination of electric energy and magnetic energy, but at the peak field level, it's either electric or magnetic. So you calculate the magnetic energy when the magnetic field is at a peak and you have all of the stored energies. Use that expression for the magnetic field inside the resonator. That gives the stored energy in the resonator. Solve that integral and you have an expression for the stored energy. Now we have the stored energy and the dissipated power. We can use them to calculate the unloaded Q, which is the ratio of those two quantities. Put them into omega U over dissipated power and you have a nice clean expression for the Q of a coaxial resonator of rod radius A and housing radius B with those surface resistances at frequency 2 pi f equals omega. We have surface resistance in here, and that deserves some commentary. The boundary conditions for electric and magnetic fields are such that at a perfect conductor, the electric field is perpendicular and the magnetic field is parallel. But real conductors aren't perfect. They have resistance. And if there is resistance in the conductor, there will be a parallel component of the electric field the surface resistance is a ratio of the parallel component of the electric field to the parallel component of the magnetic field. This literally is V equals I R. You have R ohms is volts per meter divided by amps per meter along the surface. And then in terms of material properties, it's the square root of pi frequency mu naught over the conductivity of the metal. If the metal is a perfect conductor, sigma is infinite, the surface resistance will be zero. You see the frequency under the radical. Since the conductivity is normally taken as frequency independent for metals, across almost all frequencies, the surface resistance goes as the square root of frequency for metals. For superconductors, you have the two-fluid model, which gives you a different expression for the conductivity, and the surface resistance goes as the frequency squared. This is data taken out of my PhD dissertation from many years ago of the surface resistance versus frequency for a metal, brass in this case at room temperature, it's going as the square root of frequency, and for a superconductor where it is going as the frequency squared. Now the rod's not just floating in space, you're going to have to mount it somehow. You'll have to design some sort of mechanism, and usually it's made out of a dielectric. You might construct a post out of plastic or resin or even ceramic. No matter what, it's going to change the Q a little bit, because all dielectrics have some loss to them. 
To get the Q in this dialectic present, add the 1 over Q. So the 1 over is resistive Q, which is the Q we just derived. Q sub R is a resistive Q, plus the loss tangent of the dielectric, which is a material property that you can look up. But that loss tangent should be multiplied by the fill factor because you're not going to fill the entire resonator with dielectric. Fill factor is the ratio of electric field energy in the dielectric over the total electric field energy in the resonator. I'll leave it for you to do that calculation depending on where you're putting your dielectric. But the takeaway point is locate the dielectrics where there's no electric field. You need to mount your resonator. You're probably going to mount it with, say, a piece of Teflon or if you need temperature stabilization, a piece of resin or a ceramic even. And limit where you put it to places where there's no electric field, such as the very center of the rod. So hopefully this sheds some light for where the expression for the Q of a coaxial resonator comes from. It's approximate because the electric and magnetic field expressions that we used are approximate. Other resonators, such as rectangular cavity resonators and cylindrical cavity resonators and dielectric resonators, have much more precisely known expressions for the electric and magnetic fields. In this case, if you use this expression to calculate the Q for copper resonator at room temperature, you'll probably get something in the neighborhood of 4,000. And then you'll go to measure it and you will get something around 3,500. And that, that is actually what happens. And the discrepancy is because of the approximation we made on what the electric and magnetic field distributions are. But this is the expression that you can use as a guide to design coaxial resonators.